this time we're going to um, bring our guest speaker today. Dr. Mike Dyer earned a master's in animal science and DMV degrees from DVM, I'm sorry. Degrees from The Ohio State University after completing a bachelor's in zoology at Marshall University. When graduating from OSU College of Veterinary Medicine, he began working in a mixed animal practice in the tri-state area where he now owns eight hospitals. Dr. Dyer. Well, it's certainly a great opportunity to speak to a body of um, animals that will listen to me. Um, you don't know that. The two-leggers, yeah, maybe not. But uh, yeah, so uh, my mother, Shirley Dyer, um, I'm not sure when your mom ask you to do something is she asking or telling you and uh, but I'm glad to be a pinch hitter today for uh, the speaker that was designed to be here and um, there's just some new things in veterinary medicine and there's some things old things that I'd just like to maybe uh, bring you up to speed on but a lot of folks don't really have a good understanding maybe of what all veterinary medicine entails but it kind of shows the scope the breadth and the depth of what veterinarians do and what all they're involved in in your world that's kind of behind the scenes from food production, food safety, research. And then we're going to tie that into what's going on now with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 disease and um, perhaps what's going on in the animal populations as well. And so there's way more species involved with, with COVID-19 or with SARS-CoV-2 than what we once thought. So I, I could talk for hours and hours about the profession of veterinary medicine, and I've only been given 20 minutes. Um, so uh, it reminds me, though, my dad was telling this story about me. That was, I had a little buddy, a little friend that I played with in the neighborhood when I was a kid, and um, we would kind of compete, you know, like he would say, uh, my dad's stronger than your dad, and I'd say, uh-uh, my, da my dad's a lot stronger. He could beat up your dad anytime, you know, and, and he said, well, my mom's a lot smarter than your mom. And I said, well, I said, what makes you say that? He said, well, my mom can talk for a whole hour on one subject. I said, well, that's nothing. My mom can talk for a whole hour and not even have a subject. Uh, <laughs> back. She's heard that before. <laughs> so I'll try to condense this to 15 to 20 minutes. But um, so I really just want to make some awareness uh, to community members about the broad scope of veterinary medicine. It's not just a, a little clinic on the corner somewhere that works on dogs and cats. Um, there's research going on. There are specialists in veterinary medicine in every field that there is for human medicine. So there are cardiologists, internists, ophthalmologists, oncologists, dermatologists that go to school beyond the eight years that I went. They'll go four and seven more. Uh, to specialize and, and become board certified in all these specialties. And so if you have a specialized problem with a pet, you can take them to a place like Ohio State or a private practice and, and uh, get your needs met when they do some really remarkable things. And have you ever been to, a, well, I know you have, a Walmart or a tractor supply or um, Rural King. Think about how many aisles are dedicated to pet supplies. It's almost 25% of the store food, toys, leashes, all the stuff that goes. So the pet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. And Americans are uh, lead, the, lead the way, I think. But other areas, agriculture, food production, food safety. You know, I used to talk about, uh, when I would talk to 4-H groups about the cereal and, that they ate and the milk that went on it and it came from where, and they say Kroger's, and I say, no, it came from a cow, and they go, oh. And what if that cow was sick when it gave milk that day? Oh, so veterinarians are actually the monitors for diseases of food production, beef, chicken, all the things that we consume that are animal related. Um, and have you noticed in your lifetime that what used to be tied up out back made its way onto our porches and now they're in our bed, right? How many of you have at least one pet? So that's about, about right. So it's estimated that three out of every four households in America have at least one pet. And um, you know, they, um, there's a lot of human health benefits. There's a term called zoeia, which means the mutually beneficial relationships that occur 
with animals and people. And there's even data on um, sick people and uh, with all types of mental illness, um, depression, loneliness, but even physical parameters like heart rate, blood pressure. When an animal comes into the room that they identify with, they can be hooked up to monitors and their, their numbers will come down and, and uh, the stress relief. And I have one client who, who had a son who actually took his own life and she was at home during the day and her husband was at work and she brought her dog in to see me and she said, you know, Dr. Dyer, I don't know if I would have made it without this dog. He would get up in the bed with me in the daytime when my husband was at work and just having the presence of that being there that had what seemed to be unconditional love. It didn't replace her son, but that bond, she said, that really helped her through her grieving period. And so I get to see these relationships every day and also get to see the end of life when those pets have to be put to sleep or euthanized. And I see the emotional turmoil and the grief that people have. The bond is real and they're among us for a reason, you know, our, with our faith, I mean, we, we, we've realized that God created those creatures just like he did us, and we're made kind of in their image. Thankfully, we're not made totally in their image. Um, but there's so many human health benefits, and um, I'm reminded of this story where this man was uh, really kind of upset with his wife and his dog, and he, uh, he locked them in the trunk of his car, and the loyalty of a dog is just amazing. And so when he finally let them out, only one of them was glad to see him. <laughs> so but dogs like you know you come home from work and your kids they, they grab your pant leg when they're little and they're happy to see you daddy daddy whatever you know they're teenagers that kind of stops you can't you know they're not there anymore but the dog they're still there right unconditionally and um and so we know that there's just a lot of uh, a lot of benefits so there's this concept then of this One Health initiative, and it's not new, it's been out 10, 10 years or more, the concept, and there's, there are actually organizations that focus on the merging disciplines in human medicine, veterinary medicine, dentistry, nursing, all the healthcare alliances that go along with that because the human-animal bond is such a, a real thing. And so, uh, you know, the CDC has a website that uh, describes some of that, and there are organizations that foster that. And I can remember being in veterinary school, and some of my professors would go over to Children's Hospital and help a surgeon do a heart surgery on a child. And I'm thinking, wow, that guy's really sharp, you know. And then, the, then there were cases where the surgeons from Children's Hospital would come over and do a surgery on a dog or a horse or whatever. And, and that collaboration is important, and so there's so many avenues and as we talk about infectious diseases, uh, we're gonna see how really important those relationships are. Zoonosis is a term that refers to diseases or conditions that are transmitted from animals to people. And um, 60 to 70% of new and emerging diseases, I'm gonna show some slides, originate in animals. And so veterinarians are kind of on the forefront of researching those diseases and how they're transmitted and uh, a lot of technology behind that. But you know, we're not, our society has become globalized. We can be anywhere in the world. And you, know, you think about how quickly COVID-19 spread. You know, we heard about it, that it was coming, and then all of a sudden it showed up in Washington State, and the next thing you know, we all had it, right? It was all among us. And, um, but the transmission with population densities, you can see in busier areas than where we are here, like in New York City, how the congregation of people coming together. The same thing in animals in a barnyard, like that, that barn was the source in Malaysia where uh, a, a virus was started in, in rats and then went to pigs and then went to people. And so um, many of those viruses that we talk about, and you see the monkey drinking out of a water spigot, and then surely sometime later a human probably gets his drink there too. And you just see how easy it is with close association with people to people, people to animals, and vice versa. So this is just a little busy slide, but it just talks about several different viruses and different infectious diseases and where they originated from. And we talk about how diseases are transmitted and some are arthropod, arthropod born, so like mosquitoes, ticks, and insects. Some of them are from rodents and bats. And, um, but uh, these, these things have a way of when they get into the human population and they mutate, um, they, they then get traveled uh, through whatever means, airlines and whatnot. And so this is kind of how the uh, SARS-CoV-2 got here so quickly. But there, once again, 70% of vector-borne uh, or, or diseases emerging and re-emerging infections are 
uh, vector-borne or they're zoonotic. So they, they come from animals into people. So, uh, of, you know, the, the HIV virus that, that came in people, actually the, you know, transmission happened once when it went from a, actually a simian virus from chimpanzees and went to humans. And then uh, there's one that's not talked about very much that actually came from gorillas that came into humans. And so um, these viruses actually, the SIV means simian or monkey related immunodeficiency viruses. They, they uh, started out in certain species of monkeys and then somehow would contact with man and then we ended up with HIV and the disease known as AIDS. So that's another, you know, a classic example of a zoonotic disease. So this is just a graph showing as far back as 1940, and there's even some data back into the 1800s where the red bars are the zoonotic diseases and the non-zoonotic ones are in brown below. But um, it just shows you that 60 to 70% of, of diseases worldwide, even up until today, are still uh, coming from animal populations. So SARS-CoV-2, that is actually the name of the virus. COVID-19 is the name of the disease that's causes the that the virus causes, right? So, um, so there's this question, and, and maybe you've had this question in your mind about whether or not um, do my pets, can they get SARS-CoV-2? And, um, and then, you know, there's this question about uh, zoonosis from animals to humans, but what about from humans back to animals uh, and then maybe back to humans? That's a whole other pathway we have to start worrying about, right? And so there's some data that I want to show you here that might, it's just some interesting stuff. And um, so we're looking at these, uh, these are all coronaviruses. And in, in veterinary medicine, a lot of the species I work on, my cats have coronaviruses, dogs have a coronavirus, um, <laughs> cattle, turkeys, uh, lots of species have coronaviruses. They're pretty, pretty much everywhere. But some of the, the ones that um, have arisen that are of concern, the top three or four there uh, have now attenuated over time. Um, the one with the cow, uh, it's about the third one down, was actually thought to be the, um, the Russian flu back in 1899. It came from rats to cattle and then to people. And it was very deadly back then. And they suspect, these researchers suspect, that SARS-CoV-2 is going to behave a lot like the Russian flu did back then, in that it will be dangerous for a while, and then it will attenuate, and then it will become less virulent, less pathogenic. And now, Russian flu pops up occasionally, but it's nothing more than a severe cold. And so, hopefully, that's the path that COVID-19 takes. But the, the same coronavirus, the DNA and so forth, was very similar to these viruses. But you can see that... It looks like bats and rats are pretty much the bad characters that start these things. And then they go into other intermediate hosts like uh, pigs, cattle, llamas, uh, camels, uh, certain other species, and then with close association to man. But these viruses, they get in the, the host tissues and, um, you know, a virus wants to survive. If it kills its host every time, if it killed us all, then the virus itself wouldn't survive. So attenuation means that they kind of lessen in severity over time. So I think we're kind of seeing that with some of the new variants, hopefully. Like Omicron came in with a vengeance, and, but it wasn't quite as pathogenic. It wasn't quite as deadly. And, um, and so uh, hopefully we're seeing a downturn. There may be some other variants that pop up. Um, but uh, anyway, so this is just kind of showing over the course of history some of the coronaviruses. There are lots of other classes of viruses, but these are just coronaviruses that um, go through intermediate hosts and then make it to man. All right, so everybody asks what all species can become infected with SARS-CoV-2. I didn't, this is pretty new data. This was, it's on the USDA's website um, and CDC has a, a more comprehensive list than this. Uh, dogs can become infected. Cats are more susceptible than probably most of the other species. Um, there were some cats that uh, that actually one or two have actually died. Uh, the most illness that we would see in cats, and I haven't seen any in my practice, or if I did, I've just missed it because they're so mild, but they might show some mild respiratory symptoms, have like a little cold, and then they get over it in about the same amount of time that we would. But the thing about cats is, is um, uh, 
you know, the zoo cats, like in Brooklyn Zoo or one of the zoos up north, they, either their tigers or their lions uh, were, were infected. And one of my classmates was working in that area, and he came up with a good recommendation. He said, you know, I've, I've got an answer for the for the, these zoo animals that are getting uh, COVID. He said, I just recommend social distancing and stay at least six feet away from any coughing tiger. <laughs> so I thought, that's pretty good advice. But... Uh, <laughs> So for some reason, felines are more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 than dogs and other species. And one thing that I found really interesting was white-tailed deer. So there are some studies in the Midwest, Illinois, Pennsylvania, even Ohio. Um, studies were between 30 and 50% of white-tailed deer in the wild have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. And how they got started being infected, maybe a deer farm, and then can, can, came in contact with wild deer. And then uh, they collected these samples in urban deer with nasal swabs that were more kind of tame. You know, deer are everywhere now. Um, but, um, and so their seroprevalence is, is it's between 30 and 50% depending on, but they don't show any illness. But what's, what's concerning is, is what if those white-tailed deer are shedding that virus and then everybody deer hunts next year and they're, they harvest their deer and they're, they're collecting, say, you know, they're gutting the, the uh, intestines or whatever and they get exposed to tissues from the deer and then you have a reemergence of a new, a new SARS-CoV-2 strain that could come back. So not to alarm anyone, but these are pathways with, that we have to think about. Um, back to lions, stay six feet away. But elephants have been shown to have antibodies. Mink have been hit really hard. The mink industry, uh, we don't have a lot of those in the United States, but in other countries, mink are farmed for fur. And, um, but it's wiping out. They're really susceptible to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, other creatures, but the monkeys, gorillas, fruit bats. And, uh, and so on the subject of bats, I mean, it is thought that the um, Oh, I forgot the species of bat that we think SARS-CoV-2 came from. And then there's this discussion about whether or not the Wuhan lab uh, had the virus to do research and then it got away, or did it really come from the wildlife? And that's still to be determined. But we do know that it, that it did uh, originate in bats. So why is this important? Um, well, for what we've just talked about, um, Dr. Greg Brenner uh, is a uh, veterinarian and a PhD and he studies molecular genetics and genomics and he's just a, uh, a brilliant guy and he's made many discoveries with DNA sequencing on what happens to these viruses when they get in the body and how they mutate. And in cats, they, they mutate. But what's, what he's discovered is, is that when it goes into a different species, the mutations that occur in a cat are different than the mutations that occur in a dog. So when it comes back out of the cat, it can cause different symptoms than a dog strain might cause. Uh, same for all other species. So he has these DNA sequencing charts where it shows that as the virus comes back out of a host species, the, the behavior of the virus and the DNA sequencing, and therefore maybe the symptoms would be very different. So why that's important, um, this is the guy, Greg Brennan. Um, we talk about zoonosis and reverse zo zoonosis. And, and, um, there's, this is really a hot topic. If you look at the date there, February 17th, this is a real recent talk. And so he's just delivering this data. But um, what they're concerned about is, is um, Omicron um, has a lot of similarities to the mutations that occur in mice. So uh, the pathway would be that, you know, I, um, we had uh, mice got COVID from somewhere from a human or from another species. And then they, uh, mutations occurred inside the mouse. And then it could be that Omicron actually is from, uh, from, from mice. So now we have to worry about getting all the mice out of our barn and pet mice and whatever. So anyway, this is kind of cutting edge research that uh, is being going on. This, is, this guy's at UC Davis, but uh, once again, just showing that veterinarians are kind of on the forefront of some of this research. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant guys out there doing this kind of research. So this is just a slide that uh, I was going to talk about. You know, it can be, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 can be traced to a species line of origin. Uh, the modern DNA technology and genomics and Omicron appears to come 
from mice. So that's still a little early to make that determination definitively. It's not published yet. So you're, you're, you're like one of the first group of people to even get to see that. <laughs> but, um, but his early work is showing that when he gets those uh, back, it, that it's more, it's more compatible with, with the mice uh, derivative. Next slide. Oh, that's just a promo for me. But uh, <laughs> so uh, I was invited to do uh, every other week segment on WSAZ and uh, did the first one. It's a lot of fun, but uh, I kind of enjoy talking about my profession. Um, I uh, wasn't the greatest student at Marshall University, and my mother had to, uh, you know, I don't know, she had to rebuke some evil spirit out of me to get me to study. But uh, uh, I've, I went to Ohio State and worked on a master's degree to get into vet school, and, and I did research on beef cattle in the animal science department, and then um, uh, finally got in vet school after three tries. And so my college course was about 12 years, and uh, so I got started a little bit late. But um, because of that struggle, uh, I would tell you this, that my advisor at Marshall told me I would never, <laughs> I was a pre-engineering student, and uh, calculus was not my friend. And so I went to my advisor and said, you know, I think I want to be a veterinarian. And he said, he laughed at me. He said, what? you'll never get in vet school. Your grades are way too bad. And uh, so I, uh, I, I was depressed for a little while, but I was determined. I think it's what I needed. But uh, so I finally uh, got my grades up and got accepted at Ohio State. And then I came back to practice in Proctorville and Dr. James Joy at Marshall's parasitology department asked me to come over and talk about hookworms to his class. He had to be out of town and he said, could you give a lecture from a veterinarian's perspective on hookworms to my class? I said, sure. So I go in, I give this talk and I come out uh, after the lecture's over and I'm walking down the hall and who pops out but that advisor that told me I would never make it. <laughs> <laughs> He said, Mike, he said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, Dr. Joy just asked me to do a little lecture on hookworms for his class. And he said, well, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm a veterinarian over at Proctorville. And he goes, oh, you made it? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, any chance I get to talk about veterinary medicine, um, I, I, I enjoy doing it. And I'm still passionate about it. I've been in practice for 29 years. And uh, um, we at Proctorville, um, the biggest honor for me is that Ohio State now sends students to me, fourth year graduating students to do internships and that they would trust them to me. And the reason is that because we're somewhat rural, we're three hours from the specialist, um, a lot of our local veterinarians have had to learn to do things because people can't afford to go to Ohio State or, or don't want to take the time to go. And so we do lots of orthopedic surgeries that are done at specialty practices. So. They want students now to graduate and be more practice ready, so they send them to Proctorville. And uh, just recently, last year, they opened the Frank Stanton uh, Foundation um, Spectrum of Care Clinic, which is, I jokingly say, so you built a Proctorville Animal Clinic on campus? And they said, well, yeah, sort of we did. So it's separate from the main hospital with all the specialists. It's a regular practice on campus that operates a lot like my practice does. And they let them do things earlier in their career so that when they graduate, they're more practice ready. And so I'm uh, glad to be a part of that. I serve on several boards up there, but um, you know, the, I just uh, today really wanted to kind of give you guys the scope and the, the breadth of veterinary medicine in general, and then talk a little bit about COVID because it's kind of, you know, it's a topic that we get asked about commonly. And um, you know, just to bring the old, uh, thing full circle. I, I heard a Native American talk one time. He was talking about the bond with animals and so forth. And, and you know, this is generational. It's, it's since animals were ever with us. And how when, a, when one of their fellow uh, Indians would pass away, um, when they buried them, they would get an acorn and bury it on top of the, the grave. And that um, the fertilizer from the body decaying would supply the acorn as it sprouted it to become a huge oak tree. And that oak tree would then give rise to countless acorns year after year after year, which would feed the deer, which would feed the Indians. And so that's kind of the, the circle of life. And so the human-animal bond is, is real. Um, sometimes if you don't have affinity for animals, you just think they're gross and they poop and all that stuff, right? <laughs> but 
um, they're here for a purpose. And um, those relationships are really strong. And even if they're for food purposes, while we have them, we've been given dominion over them, which is a profound responsibility to take good care of them. And so uh, thank you guys. I hope I didn't go too long, but uh, I can come back. So thank you.